some time or a case by case situation just by keeping it open? We can sure add that in there. Yeah. Yeah. I always hate definitive. Right. Cannot exceed if some were a hot topic. Yeah. Any other discussion? I'll make a motion to approve the rules of conduct with the amendment offered. Is there a second? Oh, we have a motion and a second. We'll take a roll call vote. Dean? Yes. Kim? Yes. Bradley? Yes. Mark? Yes. Corey? Yes. Doug? Yes. Enos? Yes. AJ? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, next is the business discussion. And the first thing that's there is the assessor vehicle. Yes. And first of all, I want to apologize for the lengthiness. It should have been shorter of my response, but I've been under a crime time crunch with the state this week with the abstract and recon. And we, even though this incident was recorded on 627-22, I did not know about it until Tuesday. Um, Mark informed us and then I asked Mark if he would give me, so I'm not blindsided, if he would give me a copy of of what the incident was. And he said that he gave it to AJ and to, and to ask AJ, I mean, Enos, and to ask Enos. So I asked Enos. So he got me the copy on Wednesday of this week. So I only had like 24 hours to try to just absorb it and think through it. And so basically the next step, again, I got everything written out. I, I would have shortened it, but I was just under a time frame to where I could. So. Any discussion on it? My biggest concern was I didn't know where to read through the handbook to evaluate how to process it. I didn't know how to evaluate all the statements that were offered because I didn't know where to go in the handbook or which handbook to refer to. How do I make a judgment on this without having the guidelines of what the conduct should be? Good point. Good point. Yeah. Good point. I, mean, I got the handbook here. And I don't, I don't think it says anything. I mean, I've read through this before. Yeah. But there is, yeah, we have we're not under this yet unless they go ahead and, and uh, What's the uh, normal procedure for something like this? I mean, is this is this incident report to supervisors, or I guess is there like an HR type? You know, what, who's this? And then what happens after this is, you know, who investigates, who makes decisions, who does? What's just the general procedure or something like this? I would think that's why I was wanting a handbook. Where are the answers as to how? What's our procedure? If if it was normal county business. I shouldn't say this is it's all kind of business, but if it was, you know, everybody has their own board. This board is different. We don't oversee it. We have to come to everybody to get to do anything. Okay. Um, so if if it was brought to us, um, we would do we would pass it on to HR. We have a contracted HR person that takes care of employee stuff as needed, basically. Um, because that's not our job to do it. Uh, it's not any other department's job to do it. So that should have came or should have went to HR there, but then at the end of it, that should have still come back to this board, being that's with the with the assessor. You know, if it was a county conservation problem, it would go to their board. If it, you know, it just there's those few separate entities, same with public health, if they have an issue, it goes to their board. Um, so it should have came to, if it did come to us, it should have went to our HR person and then that would recommend it back to this conference board with, with some sort of a recommendation from her. But like I said, we've got to have guidelines to go by to the, mm -hmm. how can you punish without. And what would you exactly punish me for? Well, I, I, well, I mean, that's what I don't understand. Because we don't have a handbook. 
But no, any which even, handbook are we even supposed if we to be didn't, referring to? I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to you. Yeah. I'm sorry. And I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say punish. I shouldn't say how can we make any decisions on something without that, you know. So whether it's coaching or training yes. or right. enforcement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, I didn't mean part of it. So okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I wasn't just, just, no, no, no. I just, how are we supposed, to, how are supposed, to, act how are supposed <laughs> to act on it if we don't have a guideline? <laughs> In the other discussion, I'm... without it you know, I... going to the handbook, go ahead. It, would it be appropriate for us to make a motion to refer this to county HR? Is that the next step in procedure without a procedure? I guess if you feel disciplinary action or <coughs> HR review should come into play, then that's the best way to go. Disciplinary is probably not the right word, but it's pretty obvious there's some working relationships that aren't working well. And that's where it may be time for HR to come in and work on some procedures to get things working well. So, but I, I definitely think when we get down to D, the handbook, we definitely have work to get settled there. So are you making a motion to pass it on to HR? I, yes, I'll make a motion because that will open it up for discussion for the rest. That's like an outsourced HR firm. Is that what that is? Yeah, uh, Renee is one blocker. She's been, she's been doing HR. HR for the county for 20 years, probably. Um, and she negotiates with like Sheriff's Union when Secondary Roses was a uh, union. Also, she did all the negotiations. So basically, if there's any stuff, since everybody's elected officials, they kind of run their own our offices, departments. So anything that would happen within those are just all those to her instead of hiring a full-time person, we just pay her on a contractual basis to, to take care of any issues that would arise. So I have a motion on the floor. I second the motion. I have a second. Good idea. Uh, we'll take vote, roll call vote on it. So I'm just curious as far as or other discussion, discussions. Yeah. Yeah. Here, just okay. So it goes to HR then. Do we have to have another? Full or is there an executive committee that then deals with stuff off of this? Is there, you know, yeah. what? Right. Okay, exactly. we do this, yeah. but then oh, what next? What are we asking the HR person to get a hold of whom and how do we want to handle it after? I guess I want to know the whole picture yeah. here yeah. I guess, a little bit before we're just sending it to exactly. HR. I guess what I would recommend is that if we send it to her since she works for the county. Um, that her response will come back to the Board of Supervisors. We could pass that along as an email back to the conference board and then make a decision on whether we need to meet again or how to act on that, I guess, instead of calling meeting after meeting after meeting, you know, but let her make a decision. She can respond back to the Board of Supervisors with that and we'll just bring it back to you guys for recommendations or suggestions. So the follow-up question to that is, are we able to just appoint a small subcommittee to deal with HR issues, or do we need to bring together the full conference board? We could have a committee and just make, just for discussion to get something figured out, but if there is something that would need a vote, you'd have to, you know, it would just take it down to, to three or four people to take care of this end of it, and then if it needs to go back to the conference board, then we call it another meeting. And we have to go through the conference board with a well, with court, you know, in order to make any decisions. So, I just have a general question because I didn't know there was an incident report. So, this is sort of new to me. And since I didn't get it, I don't know why it waited for that long, first of all. But <coughs> what That's is what an this is. Well, it is, but what do you all use it for? I mean, is it to, what do you all use an incident, just for anything? I it mean, would be, that, one, is when you're managing, if there was damage or injury or anything like so that. So it's just any kind of Then reporting. that would be a record for insurance and for following and for training. If there's any misconduct in any office, when you have an incident report, that gives you the, the documentation for either training 
or disciplinary at that point or improving procedures as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. You know, a handbook is a living document um, so that everybody can work together as a team and be more productive. And we all have a task here to be productive for the county and mm -hmm. work together. So uh, incident reports are important things to separate the emotions from what actually happened mm -hmm. so procedures can improve whether it's a slip on the floor or yeah. a mistake in a column on adding things, you know, you got to document so you can get better. Conservation board has an incident report that you guys could adopt too. I don't know what their policies are, but you know, they've got one in place already. Oh, and I think that's Jim. I think you want to do that. That one. Yeah. Yeah. And it also protects the employees because like for conservation, when they're working on the parks, if they have an interaction with the public that could be mm -hmm. of concern or something they need to learn from, that incident report allows all that data to come back to either protect or to help the employees in the county as well. Any other discussion? I have a motion and a second to get HR involved with this. We'll take a roll call vote on. Jean? Yes. Kim? Yes. Bradley? Yes. Mark? Yes. Corey? Yes. Doug? Yes. Enos? Yes. AJ? Yes. Motion carries. So I guess. <clears throat> in my long response. I mean, we do have an issue with the, the assessor vehicle. I mean, perception to the public. What, what, I mean, the last time we talked, it was okay to take the vehicle just to home and work and no personal use. And so that's what I've been doing. And, but look what happened, even though I've been doing that, like sort of the vehicle was at home. I mean, here, so I came here. And so that's why the incident happened on Saturday. because Someone thought I was driving for personal reasons. You know how it, it's very frustrating to me. I mean, how, what do you guys want? I'll listen to whatever you guys want. I mean, you know, it's, I don't know what to do. Uh, do you want this in closed session or do you want it just open? I, I guess closed. And then everyone would go just other than the board. We'll recess the regular meeting and take a motion to open a closed session. Do you want this reported or not? Well, you have Close to report closed session. So uh, it'll be, yep. Yes, and I think that's a good point. Yes. I'll make that motion to go into closed session. Is Close there a second, second to go into closed session? Close second. I have a motion and a second to go into closed session. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. And she could have stayed. Frankly, this is just a he said. <laughs> <laughs> give, me, give me seven minutes. I just don't know it. Yeah. Who was it? Mark and yeah. motion to go into closed session. Yeah. Mark and then who seconded that for closed AJ. session? AJ. Yeah. Thank you. You up to date? Thank you. Uh, next thing is 2022 budget review. Well, that's the first page right there. Um, oh, I'll share that. That's that one right there. This year, um, we've got $35,280.86 remaining um, on our budget. So that's good. That just carries and, and rolls forward. Kim, can you see that? Sorry. Yes, I can. And so that amount sort of just goes into slush, you know, when you're under each time. Um, so that, that's looking good. We turned out pretty well there. Um, Mark was given, or Mark was giving a, was given by Jackie um, a report that showed I was over budget um, and I'm, I'm not over budget. So, so that all been cleared up. Do we need to hear what happened? I, it, Would you like to hear why? 
Yeah, sure. Yes. Yeah, if, if there's that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's fine. There was a perception out there that she was over budget, so go ahead. Yeah. Um, never good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's never a good. Per but you know, but it's really strange, though. Let me just give you some background on this because I did some studying on it last year because I thought I was going to be over budget. But really, when you're over budget, all it is basically the county, you're not disciplined by the state, you're not disciplined by where it comes up is when the outside auditors come in. And it will say, okay, you did a transfer. And this happens all the time. I went back and looked at ours. We've had other department heads be over budget. Transfers, what, where it comes up is it's noted in the auditor's report. And the auditor basically says if it's what level of seriousness it is. And then basically it's just, okay, why did it happen? What's your plan to rectify the situation? And as long as it doesn't keep happening, there's, it's really not as big of a deal as what... Um, I was thinking it would be. But what happened on this one is our reval is going on and it's a lot of funds. Um, we've been accruing for it. Um, $520,000 we had back. I had to pull out a certain amount for this year and then this year, the last year, and then this year um, I had to pull out the rest. So I talked to Bob at Vanguard and he said to pull out $250,000 for, I'll just say last year's budget because it is last year's budget. And so he's been billing me. And so what happened in, I got that bill, the last bill in like June 1st. I knew it was going to put me over my budget. I signed it, put the general ledger account in my box. And when I turned something else in, I must have grabbed that. And then it got onto your desk and we processed it. Well, then all of a sudden I realized I'm over on my budget. Um, but I wasn't over on my budget because I talked to Bob at Vanguard and, um, it was a $74,000 check and he apologized because they knew not to um, bill it. I said, well, thank you for apologizing, but ultimately I signed it and accidentally put it in for payment. So it's my fault. So anyway, as soon as I talked to him, he sent that $74,000 back, um, put it in the account. So now I'm 35,000. And so Mark didn't get the updated information from Jackie. He, she, he, she just got, he just got the one that said I was over budget. So that's so he's waiting to bill you for yeah he's July yeah or, or here. yeah so he's just waiting it, it got in the wrong July. year that's June well it's really in the in the right year because I shouldn't have I mean it shouldn't have been paid so I should have just held it off till the July yeah year. and somehow it got in and so what my to rectify that situation anything I want held for the next year I've got a folder now and so I'm gonna put it in that folder so that doesn't happen again so and that was budget so that's what that is any questions. That's making the full two hundred fifty thousand dollar retainer for the revaluation. Yeah. So basically, he asked for two hundred and fifty for this past year. I paid two hundred fifty. Now I pulled two hundred seventy out, and so it will come out of that. So, and I don't know right now. And this would be we may have to do a budget um, amendment, not by my, by my doing, because they estimated the value what ten years ago, and they estimated it to be five hundred twenty thousand dollars. And you can do that, but if there's a lot more parcels, which we've got more, you know, so I don't know how it's going to stand. I'll probably, they'll have a better idea come October or November. So if it's over that 520000 which I'm assuming it probably will be with the way things are, then I will have to do an official budget amendment, so. Any questions? Okay. And what we're trying to do, we sort of sat down and talked, we're going to try to answer some of the questions that came up the last meeting. And so we are saying, how do we want to start trying to do this? And that's what we're going to try to do. So um, ready for the next slide? The next thing is a sale. Are you still on the budget here? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yes, go I ahead. Got it. Well, because the rest of it. Are you done with the budget? Well, the rest of it's in the, mm -hmm. in my PowerPoint. I well, guess we should have done that a little bit doing different. doing the PowerPoint. Right. I guess we should have done that a little bit different, but. We'll learn first time we've done a PowerPoint. So um, so let's go to the next one. So once again, these are, and it does have to do with budget and the sales ratio um, in the handbook. So really we're going to be covering in claims review. So we're going to be in this handbook, we're going to be covering C, D, E, and F. Okay. Is that fine? Yep, that's fine. Okay, that's sounds good. good. So let's talk about claims, which is accounts payable. Um, all claims are paid through the auditor's office. All financial tra transactions are public records, so anyone can go and look at claims, which is accounts payable. Um, these documents can be viewed by the conference board and general public at any time in the assessor's office. 
the records are viewed exter externally um, by the auditors annually. So once again, the claims are on record. Um, you can come down and look at them anytime. Actually, we've got a book that's about that thick and we actually keep them by month. So if you want to come in and, and see, okay, well, what did you all do that month? Just come in and, and you can see every claim. We've got them organized. And I know last meeting, you guys sort of talked about having a small committee come in and look at them every quarter. I don't know if that's something you want to do or not. It's just, it's there. We'll show you where the book is. And so. I, I know one of the, the concerns that we've heard before is the process with the auditor's office. Mm -hmm. Are, is there a consistent procedure for the auditor's office that is working for your office as well? Is that... Probably not. Probably, yeah. I mean, as far as I'm, there's a procedure written down exactly how that works. Well, how they do it. I mean, we submit the claims to them, to them and, they, and then how they, they, they pay do them it. out. So you feel like the, the procedure is in place? I and, feel it is. And it's consistent? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I do. Good. Um, Okay. okay. Let's go to the next one. Um, how the assessor values property. Um, this year, we, it's a cost manual with the use of a cost manual approved by the Iowa Department of Revenue. And that co cost book um, really was sort of developed by Vanguard um, upon the Iowa Department of Revenue's request. And Vanguard is the one that's out doing all the reval. Okay. Um, basically, you use the cost manual by formulating the replacement cost of a property and adjusting the condition with depreciation. Um, so that's the basic way to go. By using the sales comparison approach between similar properties, this is how banks appraise property for mortgages. Sales ratio method, the assessor measure, measures the level of value as indicated by sales of real property in the jurisdiction. Um, sometimes this part gets confusing. The assessor does not collect or um, calculate or collect taxes, does not set the level of the value, does not make the laws and rules for assessment. And just how if you've got questions. Um, this is really interesting, and this is what I'm really trying to educate the public on is the sales ratio information, you know, because it, it's confusing, but I'll, I'll try to do it if you've got any questions answered. Assessors are required to value the property at cur current market values. Um, and what is a sales ratio? When a house sells, the assessed value is divided by the sales price to determine the sales ratio. So if a house is assessed at $100,000 and sells for $125,000, we have a sales ratio of 80%. That means we our assessed value is too low by 80%. The Department of Revenue requires a median on that sales ratio from 95 to 105%. So basically we're out of compliance by that by 15%. So that's how basically the ratio happens. Um, so a house that sold for 125,000 needs to be valued between 118, 750 and 131, 250. The assessor analyzes all sales in the county and raises or lowers values accordingly. The Department of Revenue tracks all sales in the county and will issue an equalization order just on odd years if the assessed values are too high or too low. Like we said, the that is if the median sales ratio falls out of that 95 to 105%. The equalization order will uniformly increase or de decrease values across the entire county by property value. So if we get equalized because like we're, right now we're at 80%. If we are to get equalized, um, I can choose to raise it to 96% to get within that. Or if I don't, they'll come in and raise everybody's house the same percentage. And that can be a disservice, which I think it's on the next slide. Isn't it? Yep. After the review. Um, chasing the market. For <clears throat> 2021 uh, fiscal year, the sales ratio was 86 Unfortunately, for um, this year, right now, we're at 80.66. So people are really not going to like me. Um, this is strictly residential? Property. No, it's, it's right just now same. rural residential and residential. Okay. We also get equalized on commercial. Right. And that's hard because we don't have many. Um, so those are the categories that get equalized. Does that make sense? So this is all residential? Yes. Rural and 
community, but yep. residential only. So yep. not agricultural, nope. not commercial. Nope, exactly. There's those uh, sales reports on the assessor's website and those yep. are very informative and they have this for each specific transaction. Yes. I wonder if somewhere on there you can put like a, a total average. So anytime you hear something, look at that and know what that number is. So they can kind of have an idea. I mean, we could do something like that. Probably do. I, I could run a, a maybe do a monthly. I can run a sales ratio every month and we can just have it for the month of. Okay, that's a good idea. I, mean, is it I, I have you? no idea that's that low for sure. I mean, well, that's the, the interest rates. and Oh, well, it's, yeah, we can go through that. Um, well, that's why I, I, I did some examples. No, if they get and people are buying them and the interest rates are the main reason but do you have any idea that how does that compare with the jason I, I, i'm guessing it's that's the same everywhere oh yeah because of the way you value people are Wait, in case you want to drive by some homes just to, <laughs> it's interesting. These are all the homes that have sold or been in residential. And typically, acreage yeah, is. Because we had something like this in the February packet, right? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Yeah, oh, my God. Sorry. I remember seeing that. Mm -hmm. So that's the rule that you got. I mean, yeah, rule as in this is all urban. You got one. Yeah. Okay. And the man land value is yes. farm crossing. Yeah. Uh, per acre prices. Oh, no. I have to look at the sheet to figure that one out. Holy moly. Well, the interest rates, and what's get, that? Oh, yeah. I'm not fair. I didn't include you, did I? So I'll go through some slides that we can sort of look at, and you guys will be like, what? Nothing sold for that. Um, so go to the next slide. So this property, and I won't read, you've got the information up there, but it's Daniel Township, so it's out in the country. Um, it's got 2.42 acres, and it went for $290,000, and the house is uh, 1952. I'm trying to don't use the ones under 50000 because oh, they're just not reliable because they're either really run down. And so they're sort of, so you sort of take out the fillers and they're just usually run down and they always either go for too high or too low. I mean, there's just no consistency. And that's mandated by the Department of Revenue. Yeah. So, so is there a too high one that they, I mean, oftentimes, you know, that curve, you yeah. remove the highest one and the yeah. lowest one. Well, and also, right. Right. Yeah. So yeah, and that's why we do we do medians. So well, and sometimes too the under um, fifty thousand is between family members. Yeah, it's and just it's not so it's not really a good sale. Per, it's still an arms sale. at length transaction. It is, but, but it's typically either a builder coming in or to yeah. remodel or this or someone selling it. So we just sort of for us for our sales ratio for the public, we've just sort of taken the fifty thousand, so you guys can understand. So let me keep going on these. Okay, the next one is Silver Lake Township. And this one is a 1900, um, has 8.81 acres and it sold for 237,000. And our assessed value was 177,143. So once again, we're at 75% sales ratio there. This one here is another one out in the country. Um, Sold for three hundred seventy-four thousand. Assessed value two hundred thirty-four thousand. So our sales ratio is sixty-two on that one. It's an uh, eighteen eighty, and it's on five acres. And you'll find that acreages, whether they're out in the country, you got to one piece of the foundation. Yeah, corn in the basement. Yeah, yeah. Well, and what's so different the last two years compared to prior years is. I had to raise values. I think five, I should have got that 5% like two years ago. And I think before that, like 8%. So we have been going up um, just to try to stay, you know, in that, that ratio. But what I've noticed the last couple of years is acreages, no matter if they're in the rural area or if they're in the um, 
urban classification or urban area. It, it's still people just love acreages, but now it's across the board. It's it's everywhere. It's on everything. So this one here is urban residential. So it's in Northwood. So for uh, 124,500, we had it assessed for 84,022. Oh, am I off? No. What did I say? You said 84. Oh, 94,000. Um, sales ratio is 75, um, 1920. And it's only got 1,361 square feet. This one is in Northwood and sales price is 310,000. And this is in the area that's just um, west of the school district. What, what, what subdivision is that again? Your mom used to live there. Happy Acres. Oh, that's part of Happy Acres. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so that's where that is. The assessed value is 280,000 and the sales ratio is 90. So we're off by 10% on that one. It's uh, 2010 and it's got 1,805 square feet. You also saw crazy this is because I know that house very well. I know yeah. you. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 That was like, uh, what, three or four years ago, that was the assessed value was like 180 or $90,000. Yep. Yeah. So in three or four years. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's freaking crazy. How much? We actually have looked at the last sale price. Did we look at the last sale price on that? I started to, but then it got. Yeah, we just really ran involved. out of time. But yeah, so I think that's that been much in three years. Yeah, great. That's what I mean. It's everywhere. It's yeah, like that much, but yeah. And the bad thing, what's going to happen is once interest rates go up, people aren't going to be be able to afford that higher house. So I'm going to have to raise levels for 2023 pretty high, but then they do come down. Just like when Dan Reader wasn't it Dan Reader back had the lower. Yeah, lower residential. I wasn't here when the when the bank fell out. Yeah, you know, oh eight oh nine. Yes, yep. he he lowered across the board for everybody in Worth County, and I other counties did that too. Yeah, but just to justify a little bit, you know, because yeah, because we don't have a choice if if you know if if we got them over assessed by state, we have to. I mean, we don't have a choice on that one. So, and then I know poor Jody when she became assessor. She had to raise everything like by 10% because then it went the opposite way. And no one liked her when she first started because everyone's like, you raised my values 10%. But okay, this is another urban residential to Northwood. Assessed value 110, sold for 130, 1951 and 1494 square feet. This is urban residential and it's in Manly. We had assessed at 70, <coughs> went for 115. 1,144 square feet. This one here is in Manly, once again, urban residential. Sold for 140, assessed at 112, sales ratio 80%, and 1933 and 1,800 square feet. Next one is in Fertile. We tried to get some, the Fertile's just really with the river. Oh, geez, we can't keep up with that place. Um, it sold for 143,000, assessed value 117, sales ratio is 82, and 1,872 square feet. Well, this one is urban residential in Grafton, sold for 225,000, assessed value 136,000, sales ratio 60%. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, and only 1,500 square feet on that house. 225. And it's not even in a full town. Basement. It's not even a basement. It's nice place. <laughs> Next one, 165,000. It's urban residential in Hanlon Town, assessed value 110. I mean, 66% sales ratio. And this only has uh, 1,356 square feet. 165,000. So that's sort of what's going, gauging in the market right now. So, so is that by when you have your average sales ratio? Does mm -hmm. the house that sells in Grafton affect my house in Northwood? Yeah. It's a countywide one. It's not a place in here. Because we mass. Yeah, we mass appraise. But now having said this, and I'll go ahead and, and talk about this right now. Well, it is here. Let me go finish. Okay, avoid equalization. Assessors will likely have to raise values by 20% to avoid equalization for this 2023. Always, pref always preferable to equalization results in more equitable value. What that means is I have the choice to either let the equalization order come in and it goes to everybody. It doesn't matter what style of house, doesn't matter the property, it's everyone goes 20%. Well, 
why assessors don't try to do that. Sometimes we can't get out of that. But why we don't want to do that is exactly what you are saying. If the sales ratio is 85 in Northwood and it's 90 in Grafton, I, I, I have the opportunity to raise Northwood more than I raise Grafton. You know, so and I can raise it by, and you check that by neighborhoods, townships, just like it's been to where the sales ratios were better in the urban areas and in rural areas, the sales ratio was horrible. So that's sort of how we've been raising it by land. Because we raised land when we raised it last time, we did it all on land, but it was basically rural residential. So what we as assessors try to do is we really try to look, engage where the sales ratio is higher and lower. And we try to do the percentages correctly so it's not across the board, because in my opinion, that's not fair at all. So does that make sense? Okay. Now the assessor handbook, guys. <laughs> Let me tell you what I've done so far and what I've learned because out of our last discussion in February, I gave you guys a preliminary ones that I wanted to change. And you guys mentioned going to Renee, which I, I did and she got back with me. But even with these preliminary ones, we sign them, they're effective for my um, department. Nothing in this handbook applies to us the county handbook, nothing, because assessors are separate. So we are encouraged to get make our own handbook. And so what I'm in the process of doing, so because I talked to Renee and she goes, well, if you want me to do a whole one from the beginning, it's gonna be five grand and I didn't have that in my budget. So next year I'm gonna have to um, put a little more on my budget for that. But what I did do there was what we talked about, what policies I am changing, um, just a little bit, and it's not much, is hours of work and work period, overtime and pay, and then work schedule and travel time, inclement weather and work site closing, meal and travel expenses, credit card and vehicle use policy. Um, just because we're a little bit different and those are the ones that affect our office more. And I don't know if we want to hand these out again or, but what I did, and I talked to Renee, is on those policies, everything in Teal is what I changed. And basically, a lot of it is assessor. And everything in yellow is what the handbook is. So, so she could go and look at it. What am I changing? What was the county handbook? So she was able to go through this in about an hour. Um, I should have probably made. Then I can hand these out to you. Basically, hours of work period, I changed a little bit. And do, we, do you guys want to see these? Or Maybe do you want me to email them? Yeah, let me email you there. Right, okay. Right. Yeah. Because I think because Renee approved it with two changes that we can go ahead and, and do that. But basically, uh, we'll go ahead and email it to you. She did have two things that she wants to change, which we will, and then she approved the, the remainder of these. So Renee is the county HR person. Yeah, the same one that you're going to go okay. to for, and of course. I brought the one wrong one. Okay. Okay. There's two things on it. I'll let you know. I am changing those to her specifications. Um, I will send this across to you and I'll let you know what I changed per Renee. And so what I would like to do, and I don't like that we don't have anything else that comes up. We have nothing. None of this applies to us. So what I'd like to do is have you guys approve this. Um, and we can do it in the meeting, dependent on me sending the information to you. And then I'm um, also in the handbook is that anything I don't have a policy for falls back to this. And then that way I can keep adding policies. But anything, and I went by the handbook pretty much, except some differences. So that at least I can tell my staff, okay, this is our policy. This poly overwrites policies in here. But if I don't have a policy, policy for it, it re reverts back to here. So we've got that structure. So we'll need that copy. Yep, right. I'll give and them both to you. Email. Basically, that works just like the sheriff's department. We have the union handbook, and then whatever the union handbook doesn't cover, we refer to the county handbook. Okay, and so that's what I'm going to be doing. So yeah, there's some consistency coming in that. Okay, so I would like a, a motion based on after you guys look at it, prove it now based on you guys getting the information to see what Renee wanted me to change and then we can start the process because it'll be a process I'll try to work on this when I'm downtime and do a couple more procedures and just try to get it to where maybe in two years we've got our own handbook 
It's got to be faster than that. Okay. Then, then I will put in my budget. If we do have to do a budget amendment, then I can put it in my budget this year. And okay. so, because right now we're into an hour's worth at the county HR for budget expenditure correct. so far that we haven't budgeted for. But the next step is we, as a board, we all need to review the current draft. Yep. And then probably go through HR one more time for one more re final revision. And then we would need as a board, I'm just talking through procedure. Okay. Um, as a board, we would need to come back and approve it and accept it and put it in place. So we're still looking about, even fast tracking it, we're looking okay. at two, two or three months probably, right? For this first one, I mean, for my handbook? To get it into place and okay. authorized. Because I know that um, she's already told me exactly what to do. So I'll make those right. changes, send it back to her mm -hmm. with those changes. And then I'll say, Renee has approved this 100%, send it to you guys. And then whatever time frame that takes is what you're right? Yeah. Okay. I, I think we need what? to keep this moving to help yeah. Yeah. everything procedure, process-wise to get better in place. Okay. I think this needs to move faster. Yeah, I don't think we should approve it until we see the yep. finalized okay. copy. Absolutely. Yep. Sounds good. So do we want this current draft or do we want to wait for the changes to come wait through? Renee's I think we're we'll waiting until Renee does. So we get a final draft. And then I'll have her say, I, I approve this, you know, or whatever. And so you guys know it's approved by Renee. You have no idea how many emails we get with red line version, red line version. Exactly. Um, well, give me two. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's the latest? If there's a direction to change it, give me that one. Yeah. Don't, don't oh, I want it at 98%, line. not right. 70%. Yeah. Right. We got it this month and next month. It's all gone. The next month, we'll, we'll put it back in. Right. We want it at 98 Remove this one, add this one. But yeah. Just so, so I'll try to get some staff on this to try to get moved up once we get through July and August, and then we get breathing room come September. So, and it is the exact same handbook that you guys read last meeting. Um, there's one word that's changed, um, yeah, and then there's one sentence omitted. So it's really and then minor. and then the two that Renee mentioned, and that that's what she. Yeah. Those are the two things. So yeah, so I'll get that going. I'll get it to her tomorrow. Oh well, okay. no, Friday, Monday. And so I'll keep that going. Okay. okay, next. And this is something else, guys. We just, and like you say, communication, communication. I want, I want to come out and discuss what the issue became with the credit card because there's different perception of what the first offense was or so what happened is when I became, it was an assessor credit card. My name it was not on my name. Um, goes through the county. I think there's one for each department. Um, when I got the credit card, I was told by AP, and they will verify this, that it's easy. Because when you go out, if you have a drink with a meal, you know, you shouldn't have that, I mean, a credit card, a, a, oh God, an alcohol on a credit company credit card. So what I was told is it's just easier if you do it and then you send a check to the credit card company with the AP check. So that's how it's been done for a year. And so if that, if it shouldn't have been that way, then AP shouldn't have done it for a year. So I guess sometime after that year, nobody came down and told me don't do that anymore. So I was assuming it's okay because it's been going on for a year and I was told that was okay to do it that way. Well, then as things tighten up, which it should be, um, I guess that changed. <coughs> no, no one came down and told me how I found out about it was, of course, in a board of supervisors meeting. So it sort of blindsided me, you know, because if they would have come down and say, don't do that anymore, I wouldn't have done it anymore. So my first thing that the policy changed was in a supervisor's meeting. And I said, okay, I said, I wasn't aware of that. And so what happened about two years later? So to me, this is my first incident. A accidents happen. And you'll see, I, mean, I put, sort of let's look at this. I put $2,657 on my personal credit card because of all my travels and training. And Jay put 921 on his credit card. So anyway, what happened when um, that incident happened, which it wasn't abuse, it wasn't, but we're not going to discuss that. What happened is, Mark called, uh, I think he called it, he was going to call a conference board meeting because of that one, huh? It was AJ? Okay, he was going to call a conference board meeting because of that one charge. But, and I'm like, but, but what? process did I go through first? 
Yes. I went to you first. Then. You did. And then you said you're going to. Yes, correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Um, so I knew about it. And I'm just like, ah, you know, I battle everything else. It was one incident. It's a, some reason it turned into this huge, huge thing. And I felt one incident because it, it's hard. You get out there and you got 10 assessors and you got 10 different credit cards and you have and we have them separated. It's just it, it's. So I just thought, God, I'm, I'm tired of it. I, I just I'll turn the card in. I, I'll just turn it in. Avoid the issue. Well, then that. I guess I really didn't realize how much if I use my personal credit card and I remember the chair from the last meeting said, well, you can always get invoices ahead of time. You, you know, the county can, you know, you can do it that way. You shouldn't have to use your credit card that much. And I was trying to advise, yes, I do. In fact, I, I just two days ago, I signed up for a USPAP class in September. I didn't have an option for an invoice. They want credit cards. So once again, another $400 on that. Judy and I are gonna be going in September. Um, hotel room, another conference. We're gonna be going in September, October. Um, and so I feel that everyone is looking so negative about the company credit card use over one instant. And I just said, I just don't wanna deal with it. We can't keep doing this, it affects our credit score. You know, if you only have a $3,000 limit, it's your personal card. Um, it, it's not fair to ask any employee to do that. So I guess what I would like to do and what I did to try, you know, like again, when, when an error is made, which one time in my opinion is an error, it's not a, an ongoing area error. So what I did and why I changed our credit card policy in my handbook is because I'm gonna make employees be responsible for all food and drink purchases. So then there's no chance, you know what I mean? That it can get actually on the credit card. So I, I feel this is not fair. I feel I need to go back to NSB Bank and get the assessor's card again. And with my new policy, it's going to, and what I did say in the new policy too was we're gonna do food and drink on our own credit card. And I said that for some reason, if that's a hardship on you, come to me and we'll find a resolution. Um, and what else did I say? And I, and I put in there, continue, any continued abuse of this, policy may lead to disciplinary action. Because with me, I'm not gonna discipline my employee for one mistake that goes against it. You know, if it's a habit, then I, I definitely will. So I guess I need you guys to tell me what you think. I don't think you should have to put $2,600 on your personal card if you don't want to. So well, and you know, it's, I, and, I, and I knew, and, and that's why I think I got shot down because it went back and forth and back and forth between the chair that, Oh no, you just, I do mine on mine. Well, it's just, I got a whole staff. I've got a whole staff. It's not, and, and a lot of times when we want classes, they fill up. So I have to put it on my credit card because they won't wait to take a check. And this is proof and, and there's more. I mean, I've turned in more receipts since then, so. And your changes that you're making to this is in your, in the assessor handbook you're putting together that all meals and drinks are on your credit Correct. cards and then we'll pay that and straighten it out. Crack it out. And so that's your we're first. We're doing motel bills. We're doing yep. gas. We're doing stamp. Whatever. Yeah. Yep. yep. And then if, you know, it happened once out of two years, I mean, gosh, when you see how much we travel, I mean, sometimes you grab the wrong credit card and, you know, but I'm putting up tools to try to have that be prevented. And that's all you can do. To me, this is a piece that goes with that handbook. Once we have the handbook Correct. approved, then we know the process, then we can trust okay. the credit card out in the field. And, you know, maybe it's that graded, uh, moving all food and drink and beverage to personal and then reimbursement is a very good move. And so that's what I want to do. That's because that's usually where the slippery, slippery slope comes in. Yep. So tips are also not allowed. No, nope. tips are not allowed. And typically I keep the credit card, you know, if I'm not going to the conference, typically I won't, before I had, I gave you the credit card because of food and, mm -hmm. and drinks. Well, and we have to pay for the hotel when we check out. And you do, unless I can do that online, but I'll try to keep the card in my possession as much as I possibly can too, because I don't want one of my employees to slip up and feel they need to be disciplined, you know, by an error. So. Um, Bradley's graph. I, I agree with that. You know, we do uh, weekly claims in the county. So 
It's not like it was sitting a month at a time waiting for a check. We do weekly claims. So, so you start, you turn something in by Thursday, you're getting a check on Monday. So that is there, but I do agree that is a lot of money to put it on your personal card um, with a lot of the expenses that are necessary for the county. So, um, yeah. I'd take it and put it on my Cabela's card. It just goes. <laughs> <laughs> Get a cash back card so now. You just use them. <laughs> Because <laughs> guess what? The county don't get those benefits. But I, don't, That's I true. do understand. Yeah. Scratch that from the minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so noted. <laughs> Any other discussion? Input? Let's go on. I just want you to know in policies, almost every policy has to have this is more staff too, as management, that all of them in there saying, may lead to disciplinary actions mm -hmm. including and up to termination yeah. okay that's standard policy lingo doesn't mean it's going to happen that's yeah. all based on the fraction so yeah. they all have that, that in, the have that in yeah. there yeah. because you can't be blindsided if you did abuse it and right. then you were fired saying i was never told i could be fired for buying yeah. alcohol and abusing it so that's why it's in there doesn't mean you will be yeah Thank you. But I agree with you that goes hand in hand with this handbook. Mm -hmm. yes. It's part of it. It's part of it. Absolutely. Yeah. It's okay. So once it's the handbook is approved by you guys, then we'll go on to the next step. And then we'll right. take back. Yes. Okay. And we can probably handle that with one motion in one meeting. If you haven't, you approve the handbook. If, then, if it's in the handbook with a good procedure as to how to manage the credit card, then you can at that. Then, time. when that's approved, that should automatically okay. release mm -hmm. the credit card back into well, use. Well, so we got to do is the, the acceptable use right. policy for your handbook. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I will. Well, I'll, I, it's not now, but I'll look at that before we do yeah, that. Because so. that should be a part of it. Okay. Or else you guys don't get access to county network resources. Oh no, that's in here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay, we'll try to keep moving along here. I know it's late. Um, how to become an assessor. Basically, Iowa assessors are required to pass a coursework and a comprehensive examination before, be, before being eligible to be appointed. Once appointed, this assessor must be approved by the director of the Iowa Department of Revenue. Um, must complete 150 hours of state approved continuing education of which at, at least 90 hours must be tested during a six year term. Averages out to 25 hours per year. Fun fact, um, medical doctors require 20 years. You put that in there. 20 years. <laughs> hours. <laughs> hours a year for license renewal. Um, assessors are strongly encouraged to receive at least one professional des designation, which requires additional coursework and testing. And having our industry really push for that is it just, it's amazing how much you can learn. Um, we do have various... Um, professional organizations, um, which therefore providing education and support for assessment professionals. The I, I won't go too much into this, but the IICA, the Institute of Iowa Assess Assessors, is education and it's, and it's interesting because all three of these are my mentors. We've got Jill Hines, who is an appraiser, she's a director, and that's Jay, um, who's in my office, sis uh, sister-in-law. We've got Dana Shipley, who's the secretary, she's from Cerro Gordo. We've got Tara Bergman, who's, um, an assessor and she's from Mason City and another director is Carissa Sisson, Sisson who's in Franklin um, and she used to be in our district. So that's sort of neat that we've got, I've got good mentors on that, that board. You got the IAAO, um, you got the ISAA, then you got ISAC, which is the Association on Counties and that's stuff that all elected officials go to there along with the assessor. That's across this, the state. Um, and once again, Krissa, um, a good mentor of mine, um, is the assessor and she's a director on that board. And then we've got NACRO, which is where I went to in Deadwood, South Dakota. First time I've gone to this and it was just amazing. The president of that is actually Bob who, Eiler, who is the uh, president of, of um, Vanguard, who's doing our reval. So it was good education because he went into a reval and what to do. And there was just a lot of education throughout that whole process. And it was neat because it was 13 um, states that make up this and why there's a different one for 13 states is to get all the assessors together can get really expensive so they went ahead and did an association of 13 counties and so it's really huh if they states i'm sorry <laughs> um and then also the president elect is dixie saunders who's a good um 
a uh, mentor of mine, and then a director of Larry uh, Adresen, who is a good assessor and a mentor of mine. So it's sort of interesting to get involved in those. I'm just gonna go over a few de uh, designations real quick. Um, IAAO designation, what is it? A professional designation recognized around the global as a symbol of knowledge, experience, and competence. Strongly recommends assessors receive a designation within five years, and I'm close to mine, and it, it hasn't been easy. Um, each designation requires experimental and formal um, education qualifications, completion of specified work course, demonstration of knowledge project, and then master examination. And so these are the different designations you can get. And there's assessors that got three or four or five as they, they move up the ladder. Um, why get a designation? Instantly establishes your qualifications and credibility, um, demonstrates to the state legislator and the Department of Revenue that you have the professionalism necessary to perform the required duties and responsibilities of your office. Demonstrate that you have the knowledge to back up the actions in the assessment of your jurisdiction, and then establishes credibility when defending assessment appeals with the Property Assessment Appeals Board and District Court. Now, I only am highlighting one of these is because this is the designation I'm going for. Um, the Institute of, it's called the ICA, demonstrates a high level of professional competence in the field of property assessment and tax purposes. What's required is you have to be a member of the Iowa State um, Association of Assessors, which I am, three years experience in um, appraisals, complete and pass the following courses, which are not easy. Majority of these are um, week-long courses and, and there's a major test behind it. Um, so there's four, three that you gotta complete there. And then you go to your case study and I would have this designation now if they would have done a case study class this year. They did two last year and they're not doing any this year. And so I'm just like, okay, so I'm gonna, until they do a class, then after that, I will get my designation. So, which is exciting. Um, assessor and office and conference board. Assessor office sets up in Iowa code to insulate the office from state and local politics. The assessor appoint, is appointed, not elected. Make up the conference board is designed to insulate the assessor's office from control of any one of the three major political bodies. This would include the valuation, the budget, and the personnel. Office of, of the assessor, assessment expense fund, and the conference board are separate and distinct from county government. The office of the assessor and assessment expense board is separate tax levying authority through the conference board. Questions on that? And I'm gonna now, of course, it's gonna go down to wage analysis. And I, I, re I, I really don't wanna ever talk about this again in July. And I want this to be about education, make it shorter, but I just really feel there's so much confusion about it. And we did some really good analysis. And so I'm just, I'm gonna go through and show you what the facts are and that's it. I'm not gonna ask for anything, just gonna show you the facts. Um, assessor pay scales are not connected to the auditor, recorder and treasurer pay scales. These are political offices that are funded through the county budget and approved by the Board of Supervisors. The assessor does not have representation on the county com compensation board as are separate from the distinct county government. The conference board approves the assessor's wage as a separate entity. The office of the assessor fulfills a different statutory role with its own professional requirements. The auditor, recorder, and tre treasurer wages are typically on the same pay scale in Iowa. Now we have different districts. I wish I would, uh, yeah, go to that next page. Not yet, okay, yeah, that's right. Um, we have different districts in Iowa, which is really neat. Uh, there's, I think eight or nine in our district and we meet once a month. And I'll show you a map of that. So when you're comparing wages, you really compare within your district and within your surrounding counties. Um, so with just my district, which is, that's my district. So you guys can sort of take a look. Mitchell, Winnebago, everything that's sort of connected to us. Um, and I'm not going to read off those figures. But just for my district, my um, salary is 21.26% lower than um, anyone in our district. So keep going. And that would make, if I was to try to get up closer to them, that would make my, val my um, salary be 77870 um, 
statewide analysis. This was interesting because everyone says, oh, we're all the same and, and it's not. So, and of course we're not gonna get statewide wages typically because we're a smaller county, but this was interesting. When you analyzed um, for the average assessor wage is 84,000. And so that means I'm 24% lower than the average assessor wage. And then you go and look at the auditor, which their treasurer and recorder sort of proves that they're pretty much on the same pay scale. But if you look at the auditor, they're 13.6% lower on average than the auditor. So they're on a higher than me because I'm at 24. If I, and then you've got 12% for the recorder and then 12.6% for the um, treasurer. So if I was to get down to their level, my wage would be 74,544 being fair across elected um, statewide. Um, assessor work is by parcel and property class. The assessor must, our main, our main job is to discover, list, and value every parcel in their jurisdiction. I mean, that's our main um, job. Um, and this is something that's good to know. Property value is determined by classification, not zoning. You know, so if you're in a commercial area, but you have a residential house, you're gonna be residential. Same thing, you know, like with acreages, you always think of being dual, but they're not. You do have acreages in, in the um, city limits. And so at that right there, it's still city, but you sort of got to take the acreage in consideration when you're valuing the land anyway. Um, and this is interesting to our surrounding counties, Worth County, Mitchell County, Floyd County, Winnebago County. We all pretty much have the same parcel count. We all pretty much have the same um, employees and the wages are just totally different with the surrounding counties. Um, so that's just uh, another way that, you know, we try to balance wages is, is your counties that touch you that are, are the same size basically in the same parcels. Um, and then it's really interesting talking about how everybody wants the assessor to be as elected officials, which, you know, I've proven that the wage isn't there. And typically with um, elected officials, uh, they're going to be brought in at the same wage as their predecessor. It doesn't matter if they have any experience or not. I would say the assessor field was that way maybe. No, the assessor field wasn't that way 10, 15 years ago. They were, you know, if they didn't have the qualifications, they were brought in lower. But since modern technology took over, just it's just now to get qualified people, you know, modern technology in, in the assessor field, you're starting at what the pre predecessor was. And so that brings up with me when I first started, um, Jody was the prior assessor was making 61,000. I started at 50. So if I, if I would have stayed at 61 and just got the same percentages that the elected officials do, I would be at 72,000 right now, 72,523. So I've really tried to analyze it and be fair and get the distinction. Um, go to, keep going. No, let's go back one. Sorry, Joel, I'm terrible at this. I did. I got you. Okay, so on that one right there, the assessor wage for me last year was, I was the 16th lowest of all counties. I only got a 3% increase. So that brought me to the ninth lowest of all counties. And um, the ninth lowest of all counties is because they're all down here. Every single county is down here. Um, this is my district up here. So right now I'm the ninth lowest in the other counties are down here. So it makes sense. They got different districts. They're in a totally different area. So anywhere above that um, are people that are assessors that are making um, more. So I, would, I don't want to see my wage keep going down. This is a hard job. It's a lot of education. It's stressed education, education, professionalism. So I just wanted to, to let you know that our current levy um, is 0.5217. So we're sitting good at our levy. And then our maximal uh, levy is 0.675. So now to move on, um, July conference board meetings. Basically, we decided we want to meet the, on these once a year in July. I know what I don't want to do is once again include issues like the assessor vehicle and issues like the budget of me being over and wages. 
I mean, I want this to be about education. I want this to be about what you guys want. You know, the state requires so many things, abstract reconciliation, all these different things. I don't know what you guys want. I know what I don't want. And that's what I'm going to try to not talk about wages again. We can talk about that in the budget year in January. So, so I guess it's, and Any that's it. Or questions? Mine would be just um, wages as, yeah, you can compare anything and we do have to base on population. We do have to base on our, what is our overall valuations of properties, even though parcels might be there. Mm -hmm. We might have a lot of different parcels, but what is our overall yep. valuation of, of our properties in comparison to- And you counties? just looked that up, but we didn't have Because I think Worth it. County is around the 14th lowest population. So you're right in line based on population uh, and salary. Now, our, the ones based on that are probably in the South because population is lower. Worth County's not grown, you know, our valuations are going up, but we don't have a lot of parcels. And we do have a lot of parcels, but a lot of farmland, but you know, the valuations on it, I'd be curious to see we'll, we'll provide that. that valuations in comparisons. What's our valuations overall to Mitchell, Worth County, or uh, Winnebago County and others versus- Do you remember what you just looked up on Mitchell? We're higher than Winnebago County. For valuations? Yeah. Yes. For taxable value. That's, and so we'll, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that's good or not. So that is a good analysis. Yeah. So I will add, what I'll do in January is update this information. But add, it by population. add to it. Our population going down and we're just paying more based on our population. Like, well, the population, what's so hard about that is we're an older county too. If you still got a parcel, if you go to a county that's got a younger generation, you're going to have five kids. Our three kids or two kids, so population is going to be based on, but he's still the same parcel. It's still probably a lot of ownership outside of county, probably. So, mm -hmm. but we still have to value that the same. So, a younger, thriving, you know, county or city is gonna <clears throat> gonna have more, a lot more population, but it's still the same work. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Then I'll tell you what I tell my employees, and uh, it's my opinion, not everyone else's. Uh, you're judged on two different things, not just your work, but also yep. your attitude as well and uh, culture that you bring uh, to the county. Yep. So we talked about the uh, second one and how you could fix that. That's going to go a long ways mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So you're rewarded with having both of those features, not just one. Yep. But like you say, we got to, I am in for fixing that, but we've got to have everybody in and only one person can do so much. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's it. Anybody else comments? If not, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. I'll take a second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same side. Motion carries. Right. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thanks, guys. Let's go. You betcha. You're only staying because you got really good internet. That was did you find the education portion what where we at yeah. You mean she sends me a video. This is how we value property. Oh, yeah. Why did you want to pick it up in January? Well, There's a lot of stuff that we didn't in January. I just wanted to. We got some feelings. And that's fine. Yeah. Every video we have.